Welcome everyone uh, to this online event hosted by the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. Uh, my name is Philip Murphy, I'm director of the, of the Institute. Um, this is a very special conference uh, for what's happening in Black British history. We've been running what's happening in Black British history since what, 2013, I can't, and we've slightly lost count of how many we've had, 13 or 14. Um, uh, but this is a slightly different format. So we decided that there's so much interesting work being published at the moment, um, that it would be worth devoting a whole day to publishing in, in Black British history. And it, it's not just a volume, it's just the, the range of areas um, which are, are really active and really vibrant. So we, we decided to have four separate panels, um, a, a panel specifically on publishing for children, uh, publish on, a panel on educational publishing, make publishing and on trade publishing. Um, and so that's how we're going to arrange things throughout the day. Um, I'm sure you all now be, be very familiar with how these things work. Um, so please, uh, if you're not speaking, mute your microphones. Um, we will be recording that the whole day and we'll be making the recording available on our, our website. And if you want to ask questions, please use the, 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 the chat function um, and chairs will, will feed your questions in at the end of, of each session. Uh, just before I hand over to Michael, who will say a little bit more about voting for your favourite book, um, I really want to thank, as always, uh, Michael and Miranda for all the work that they've, they've put into, into this day, and to uh, Gemma Dorma, our um, school events manager. Um, tremendous amount of planning has, has gone in. And, and to thank all of our speakers for generously giving up their time uh, to help us today. It's a fantastic lineup. So thank you all very much and thank you for joining us. So let me just hand over to, to Michael now. Michael. Hi, welcome, welcome everybody. Thank you for that, Phil, for that for introduction. I'm so much looking forward to today. It's been a long time in the plan. I'm so much looking forward to delivering it. One of the things we want to do today is to find out what's Britain's favorite black British history book. People have been voting online and we've got, we've got the online vote in. But we thought it really fitting that we do it today. We give it out today and give you the chance to vote for your favorite book or books. And you can do it easily in chat, in chat, in chat. If you put into the chat your uh, the book and the author, the, the name of the book and the author, that will be, that'll be, that'll be fantastic. At the end of the day, we'll collate them. And from any, you can vote as often as you want, as they used to say in, the, in, some, in some countries, vote early and vote often. So I, 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 I look forward, I look forward to um, announcing the, is, is, is it the winner? No, the most popular book at the end of the day. So it, it, it's, my, it's, it's my privilege to, to, to hand over to Catherine now, who's gonna do what, what to me is, what, what, what I wanted to do from the very start with all our books, children's books. That's the most exciting, vibrant area in Black British history books today. So look, I'm going to hand over to Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much. Um, it's lovely. We've got some absolutely brilliant speakers. Um, I'm going to introduce them alphabetically because I think that's fair, but the calibre of the speakers we've got today is wonderful. And, and I'd like to introduce the first two who jointly write a, a brilliant column in the children's books magazine, Books for Keats, which is called Beyond the Secret Garden. And I really recommend you can look at it, uh, look it up online, but it's an excellent read. And they are experts uh, on children's literature uh, and black and ethnic minority children's literature and uh, all children's literature actually. But the, uh, Darren Chetty, who's a lecturer at University College London, uh, it says here, primary school teacher and a writer, but that's such a, a humble bio. You would not believe the amount of work he's done in his books. And uh, 
along with Karen Sands O'Connor, who is the British Academy Global Professor for Children's Literature at Newcastle University and the author of Children's Publishing and Black Britain. Um, and yeah, I can't recommend their column enough. And thank you very much for speaking to us this morning. Thank you, Catherine, for introducing us. And thank you to Michael and to Miranda and Philip for hosting us today. Um, I'm going to share my screen and um, we are going to give you a whirlwind introduction between Darren and I. Um, so hopefully this won't go too quickly for you. I'll just minimize myself. Um, so we are going to talk a little bit about some of the books that we have looked at in our column Beyond the Secret Garden. Uh, we're going to focus today on empire and the reason that we're going to focus on uh, empire and its aftermath is because British children's literature went through a golden age uh, during empire and it therefore found its way onto bookshelves uh, throughout the world in terms of its values, in terms of its um, ideas and ideals. And these values, ideas and ideals often centered white people, centered the white British individual hero. And a lot of children's literature even today either embraces those values or tries to counter those values. So I'm gonna talk just briefly about empire history texts and then empire historical fiction texts and some of the ways that British children's literature today by Black authors has tried to counter those ideas. And then uh, Darren's going to go on to focus on community uh, rather than individual hero history. Um, so first, imperial history. Um, imperial history during the British Empire was a big deal. These are trade books that you see here. They're not uh, history textbooks and children were gifted these things by kind aunts or uh, not so kind ants. Um, they were full of lush language that glorified things like um, rape, pillage, um, enslavement of people uh, and uh, et cetera. So um, the, the language of these um, texts tended to encourage white British children to embrace these ideas of empire. But the empire was not just good for white people, according to children's literature. It was also good for the people in those colonies, including um, people in the Caribbean, in Africa, and in Asia, because Britain brought them this idea of equality. So uh, even as late as the 1940s, Britain was, in its children's literature, trying to um, embrace this idea of equality throughout the empire. But as recent um, publication from David Alasoga points out, during that time period, it was not clear if black people would ever be seen as truly British. And, and those kinds of ideas, you know, I think are important to look at in um, British historical texts because those values still seem to be so prominent. In terms of fiction, um, you had the same kinds of ideals and values being perpetrated through British Empire literature, but one of the uh, important differences in fiction was that it allowed uh, the focus to be on the um, individual or collective uh, black villainy um, throughout the empire. Um, black people were often portrayed as bad guys, um, villains, rebels, and usually villains and rebels without a cause. Um, they were just sort of randomly violent. And the other thing that happened in um, British Empire texts is that all people of color were outside of Britain. It was very rare in British children's literature for there to be any representation of people of color in Britain. And texts today have done a lot of work to counter this notion. So for example, you have Alex Weedle's Cane Warriors, um, which shows rebellion and um, revolution from the other side. It gives voice to the black people in the Caribbean and discusses why, why 
uh, they might have been rebelling, that it wasn't just random violence, that it wasn't just a sort of um, rebel without a cause. It was because they were being killed by the people who um, were enslaving them. And so this kind of corrective to British history, even in, in terms of fiction, is really, really important um, for all readers to see that, you know, there, the British Empire did a lot of damage um, and it wasn't this, uh, you know, they didn't just bring the railways as they uh, often say in India. Um, the other thing that British children's literature does now is to look at um, Black people in Britain. And so, um, especially when you look at abolitionist literature, for example, a literature for children about the abolitionist period, what you um, traditionally got during the British Empire was this idea of the individual white hero, particularly um, William Wilberforce, and um, how he essentially single-handedly um, abolished the enslavement of African people. Uh, Catherine Johnson's Freedom um, is one of the texts that uh, tries to counter this notion. And for example, um, not only brings black people into uh, visibility in Britain, but also shows how um, black people had agency in abolishing um, slavery as well. Uh, so it talks about the sons of Africa. So that's just a really brief overview of some of the things that um, Black British history is doing. And now I'm going to hand over to Darren to talk, to talk more specifically about some uh, of the other books. Thanks, Karen. So when Black British history if you just go yeah, to the first of those images. When Black British history has been included in English primary schools, it's often been focused on exceptional individuals. For example, Mary Seacole, Walter Tull, and probably less so to Claudia Jones. Uh, now there's clearly value to this, but it's useful, I think, as historians and anti-racists and as teachers, if we can help children see the broader context. So it's helpful to include the history of Black-led organizations, cultural and political, and that while centering black people, we should not exclude historical moments, uh, movements and moments of solidarity. This series of books by Dan Linden, which is amongst this pile here, I think it does an excellent job of balancing histories of resistance to racism in its many guises with histories of culture, civilization that preceded the colonial uh, expansion of Britain and Europe, and also moments of joy. If you go on to the, the next slide, thanks. Uh, I just want to quickly flag up a forthcoming book. It's out on the 3rd of June, 2021. It's by uh, my friend and excellent author, Jeffrey Boache. It's called Musical Truth, and it's a musical history of modern Black Britain in 28 songs. Some of you might know Jeffrey wrote the book Hold Tight, which looked at grime uh, in a sort of song by song way of approaching it. This book is written with Key Stage 2 in mind. It sort of looks at the songs, but also at the broader historical context. And it does that job of balancing the fact that some of these songs grew out of, of, of a context of racism. Others are, are, are merely celebratory songs. Uh, I say merely, uh, um, are equally importantly celebratory songs. And it features songs from Lord Kitchener, Linton Quasi Johnson, The Specials, Smiley Culture, Estelle, Miss Dynamite, and Ed Sheeran, uh, definitely worth a look. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, and if you just click once more, lovely, thanks. So I'd really like to take the, a bit of time to look at two books that were published just four years apart, because I think we'll see a significant variation, not only as to what parts of history are told, but also how history is written for children. And I, I, I use this with, with teachers. I was talking to teachers last night. My hope would be that in the audience today, we might also have publishers who would be thinking about this topic as well. So the book on the left, The Empire, Empire Windrush by Clive Gifford was published in 2014 as part of the Big Cat reading scheme. And on the right, the story of the Windrush by Kayan Chimbiri, a Kandase, who's uh, one of the panelists today, uh, was published in 2018 through the author's own publishing company, Golden Destiny, and it's subsequently been republished by Scholastic. 
Now, I'm going to be talking very much in favour of Candace's book and, and pointing out the limitation of Clive Gifford's. But I want to also point out that Clive Gifford is an excellent writer of children's and nonfiction texts. And that I know from experience that when you write a book that's intended to be sort of used in an educational context, it's not simply the author's vision. There's a lot of decisions going on. So I'm not in any way trying to cast aspersions on the author. There are subtle important differences in how they tackle the, the topic. Chimbiri's book includes reference to London Transport and the National Health Service advertising for staff in the Caribbean. Gifford's text says, from 1948, the UK government allowed people in places that it ruled, including the West Indies, to move to Britain. And allowed seems a rather curious choice of word. It suggests a sort of benevolence on the part of Britain, rather than the history of a war-torn nation in need of assistance from its colonies, including from the West Indies. Both books refer to how Britain was viewed by many who traveled on the Windrush as the mother country. Uh, for Gifford, the affinity with Britain is explained by the fact that the people spoke English and heard British news. But Chimbiri includes information on the many West Indians who served in the British army in World War II. Gifford talks about the West Indies being ruled by Britain. Chimbiri places it in the context of the British empire and offers a map of the empire as well as one of the region. She notes that most people in the Caribbean were of African descent. However, in schools, the students were taught little about Africa or the Caribbean. Instead, the focus was on England and English history. Gifford limits this information on education to schools were strict and teachers were treated with respect. So again, important context is either included or excluded in the two books. Both books kind of avoid the topic of the enslavement of African people in indentured servitude. Uh, but Chimbiri does begin her section on the islands with information about the diversity of peoples on the islands. Gifford doesn't address this. And instead he discusses the climate, the crops that grow and how the islands are popular with tourists. So very much a, a, an Anglo-centric, Eurocentric view of the utility of the island comes across rather than the people who inhabit it. Chimbiri places the people of the Caribbean at the front and center in her telling of history. You even see that on the cover. Both books mention Sam King, but Chimbiri also impresses upon us the fact that he's a pioneer in being the first black mayor of Southwark. However, what's also interesting in the way black history is being taught is that Chimbiri is the one who includes the fact that not all the passengers uh, on the Windrush were black. She includes the 66 Polish people who boarded the vessel in Mexico and the Indian Caribbean people who made the journey as well. Also interesting is the images in the book that have about the same number. Whilst Gifford's book only includes three with white people depicted, Chimbiri's includes 10, demonstrating an important thing that I think gets missed in primary history, that 20th century black history is intertwined with British history, not isolated from it. Chimbiri reconnects, sorry, connects recent history with the present when she says that the Windrush generation are the foreparents of many of today's black British people. There's also a, a clear uh, difference in the terminology and a sort of comfort around using uh, commonly used terminology that's there in Candace's book. Uh, Gifford ends by saying today around 600,000 West Indians live in Britain. But of course, most of the 600,000 are not West Indians, but are British born citizens. Uh, and we suggest that perhaps unintentionally, we still get this idea that the English are white. And if you're black, you cannot count among the British. Um, loads more I could say, but I will pause there because of time. Thank you. Yeah, that was, that was fascinating. Um, I, I, it sent me right back to that book, which I've got on my shelf and I'm gonna have a reread. Thank you very much, both of you. It, there's such a lot to chew over there and to discover. And, and the most important thing that I think black British history is British history. Um, and it's great from talking about her book, we're very, very lucky to have Candace here. And I'll just introduce her. In 2009, Candace, who writes as Kay and Chimbiri, set up her own one-woman publishing house to produce black history books for children. Over the next decade, she researched, wrote, published, and distributed four black history books for children from her spare bedroom. She's also worked with museums on children's trails, workshops, outreach projects, and tours. 
In 2013, she was part of the community committee for the groundbreaking Origins of the Afrocomb, 6,000 years of art and culture for the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. In 2020, Candace decided to give up publishing and concentrate solely on writing for younger readers. She signed a three book deal with Scholastic, which included a reprint of Story of the Windrush, which I hope we'll all go out and buy. Thank you, Candace. Thank you very much. Let me just share my screen. Um, so I started my journey. Oh, I'm sure my slides are not advancing. Let's try again. Try this way. Okay, so I started my journey as a self published author. I have to say from the outset, I'm not an academic, I've never taught. I don't work in the publishing industry, or I didn't. I just came into this as a lay person, not knowing completely what I was doing and making some mistakes. But I'm going to share a little bit about my journey and why I think Black British history is very important. So I didn't start out intending to be an author. That wasn't my aim. I was born in Britain. My parents came in the 1960s. They came from Barbados, which obviously at that time was a British colony. They met here, got married, had two children, two daughters, my sister and me. So officially my parents are part of the Windrush generation. Although I have to say the book I wrote wasn't really about my parents. In the 1980s, my parents decided to go back to Barbados and obviously they took my sister and me with them. I had all my secondary education in Barbados and I came back to Britain in the 1990s. I came back, my mother, father and sister still live in Barbados as do most of my family. So it was just me who came back pretty much for the same reasons that my parents had come, although by now the island had become independent and was much richer than it had been under the British empire. However, it's still a small uh, island the job opportunities are limited and being born in Britain, my mum said, why not come to London, get a job, see what you can do. And that's what I've done. And I've still uh, stayed here. I worked at a finance company, which is located in Piccadilly Circus. And I was lucky because I loved books and I loved history from going to school in Barbados. I would go into this bookshop, Waterstones, and this particular one is their flagship store, said to be the largest independent bookshop in Europe. I'm going to be very clear in what I'm saying. This is not about having a dig at the bookshops or anyone in particular. It's just to explain from my perspective and to explain what I saw and the limitations of what I saw and what I thought was wrong. So here we have the largest independent bookshop in Europe. It has a section with 10,000 unique titles for children. So 10,000 books for children. I don't have children, I'm not a teacher, but obviously I have friends, I have godchildren, I have people that I know back home. And I would go into this bookshop in London looking for books and particularly looking for books about black history. And year after year after year, I would see the same books, maybe different covers, but the same books. I'll be very clear, these are lovely books. I'm not having a go at the books, they're great books. But year after year, I would see books on Rosa Parks, Maya Angelou, African-American heroes from a limited time, and occasionally books on Nelson Mandela. So I took this picture in 2018, but it was pretty much what I'd been seeing for 10 years before that. Not being an academic, I didn't really understand why the situation was the way it was. Maybe I couldn't express well what was wrong or what was missing. But I just knew from using my eyes and from looking that this was wrong. I could just see something wasn't right, that you could be here in London and all you could see year after year were books about African-American history, important books. But it sent a message to me that that was all black history was. And if I got that message, what message were children getting? Children of all backgrounds. This sent a message to me that there was no ancient African history. It sent a message to me 
that there was no black British history, or at least none that was worth putting in a book. Now, although I hadn't had my secondary education, I knew, I knew that there was black British history. I knew there were black Tudors, I knew there were black Victorians, I knew there were black Georgians. I knew this history must exist. And that's really how I decided to start my publishing house. It was just because I had a vision and a dream to see a wider range of books. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't do everything correctly, but I knew something had to be done. I didn't particularly set out to write Black British history per se. I just knew I could see gaps and the gaps were very wide. My first three books were about ancient African history. The only reason I wrote The Story of the Windrush was because it was um, in 2017 when I had the idea. I knew that 2018 was the 70th anniversary of the, of the arrival of the Empire Windrush. I knew from some events I went to and just generally hearing people talking that this is supposed to be an important moment in Black British history, an important moment in British history, and I hadn't seen any books. Now the book that Darren referred to, obviously it did exist, it had been printed four years before, but at that time I had never seen the book, so I didn't see it in the shops, and even now I still haven't seen the book myself. So as far as I could see, there was a gap on this important information, and that's why I decided to do the book, like the others. It is challenging, I, it was challenging self-publishing. It was challenging and difficult to do both things. There's, you're obviously trying to do books that don't already exist. So there isn't a proven market for them. I decided to self-publish. I never considered going to a publisher simply because I didn't see anyone publishing the sort of books that I thought should be there. I was fortunate to have support um, bookshops, book retailers, black retailers, like Book Love, who's here today, New Beacon Books, Book and Culture, they were really helpful in helping me to get the book out there. There are a couple of people on the panel, like Darren, who just spoke, who I didn't know, but I just contacted and say, I've written this book, would you uh, give some feedback? And this is the way that I did it. So it didn't come from a place of really knowing exactly what to do but just knowing that something had to be done and that what was there wasn't acceptable. One of the challenges I find particularly with Black British history compared to the other books that I've written is that Black British history is difficult to write in a way that children will still want to read it. We are dealing with a history where a lot of it has taken place in the context of empire and the context of enslavement. And this is something that we can't get away from, but we still owe it to the readers to give them this story, this history, these facts. So we have to find a way to do it sensitively and to do it in a manner that is age appropriate. That's my belief. Last year, I decided, am I out of time? Catherine. Last year, I decided, as Catherine said, to uh, stop self-publishing and to go with a mainstream publisher. It wasn't something I considered before, but everything happens in a context. When I started, I decided to just do it myself. But I feel that there has been a shift over the last year, and it just felt that the time was right. I just felt now it was time for me to put more energy into books rather than trying to do the books and do the publishing side as well. So as I said, this is where my journey began with this range of books. In October last year in Waterstones, this is the range that I've seen. You can see here are two books about Black British history. There's my Story of the Wind Rush, a non-fiction book, and also Patrice Lawrence, who I'm meeting for the first time today, her book, a Story, set in Tudor times, called Diver's Daughter. So I still feel that although this is a good accomplishment, I still feel that we're still quite far
far. We still have more to do and there's further to go. But at least this shows that there is movement and hopefully a step in the right direction. Thank you very much, Kandasi. I'm really sorry. Everybody's got lovely and interesting things to say. So I'm going to introduce Patrice next very quickly. And Patrice is an award-winning writer of stories for children and young people. Orange Boy, her debut for young adults, was shortlisted for the Costa Children's Book Award, won the Bookseller YA Prize and the Waterstones Prize for Older Children's Fiction. Indigo Donut won Crime Fest Best Crime Fiction for Young Adults, and Diver's Daughter is part of Scholastic's Voices series inspired by UK Black and Asian history. Patrice also reviews the arts for Radio 4. Prior to becoming a full-time writer, Patrice worked for charities promoting social justice for more than 20 years. Thank you very much, Patrice. Thank you. You almost said that in one breath, Kathy. <laughs> um, I, I hopefully, can I share screen, hopefully now? So, thank you. I think we must be so used to looking at each other's partings these days, this way. Right, so I'm really going to just quickly tell you a little bit about myself, a little bit about how I wrote uh, Diver's Daughter, and I suppose just, I suppose, adding to what Karen and uh, Darren and um, Candace have already said about why it is so, so important. So just a little about, about me. These are some of the books that I've written. Um, I mostly don't write historical fiction, um, a little bit out of laziness, even though I'm a real nerd and love going into the vortex of um, histories I don't know. But the two there that really, um, I suppose, in a way, pick up on history. There's a short story in Make More Noise, which was an anthology by Nosy Crow, who published books uh, for young children through to, to sort of teenagers. And they wanted to celebrate, I can't remember if it's 100, 150 years since some women were able to vote. And I'd always been aware that there'd been a lot of cele celebration about Emmeline Pankhurst, who sort of later views weren't that very, weren't that pleasant and who did not do much to help um, African-American women to vote. Um, and I discovered a woman um, who had one, um, one Indian parent, one Scottish parent who came from Lahore to London in 1900 and was one of the first investigative journalists. And as she's kind of been whitewashed out of history. So I used the story called All Things Bright and Beautiful to bring her back in, into history. So this is a little bit about me really and about, um, and I think I share, <laughs> I sort of share sort of similarities in a sense, I think with, with sort of Candace. So, I was born in the UK. I was one of the first, I was the first in my family to be born in the UK. My mum came from uh, Trinidad, um, mostly grew up under colonial rule. So she's kind of got this, this situation where she grew up with British history. She knows more about every king or queen of Britain than, than most sort of British people do. But also of course, coming to the UK to uh, train to be a nurse in the mid sixties, you know, she was hit with that wall of, of racism as well. So it's that kind of push-pull between history and identity. And in a sense, these are really just all my families to show. Um, my first family was a, a white working class foster family. Um, there's me and my mum uh, when I went back to live with her when it looked like everybody's furniture was taken out of a British rail train. Um, there's me and my Italian stepdad who's brought me up since I was four. Um, there's me and my daughter, my sort of, um, her dad, my ex-husband, because we've always been a very multi-ethnic family with lots of different strands, because even though my, my, my ex is Jamaican, their history in some ways is quite different from Trinidadian history. My auntie baby in Brighton, who was a ripe old age of 80 then, in her first visit to um, uh, England, who was like the repository of our own family history, but can also talk to me about her experiences of Trinidad under colonialism, but also under independence. And in the middle of my biological dad, who was brought up uh, in Guyana, but moved to Barbados and came to England as part of that. I suppose you call it the Windrush generation, even though like 19, 20 years afterwards. And so Big Ben, that's just like the, the Italian cousin. So our family has always been a magnet for so many different stories of migration and history. So I kind of grew up knowing that the history that you learn in schools isn't the history, but somehow you absorb it because that's all there is for you. And I suppose just thinking about one of the things that why it's so important that we tell these children alternative stories is I was a massive reader as a child. I absolutely loved reading. But of course, every book I read told me that I didn't matter and that stories weren't for us and that we couldn't be writers. 
So one of the books um, I borrowed from the library was, because I was a bit of a completist, these were the Dr. Doolittle books, so this was the first one, and I sort of read all of them. And Hugh Lofting illustrated the, the um, books himself. And I remember looking at this image when I was six, thinking, this is supposed to be people like me. And the story is that Prince Bumper, who's um, a, the prince who's drawn us this awful caricature, believes that to get the princess, he has to be white. So these were the stories I absorbed. These are what told me about who I was and who I mattered. And at the same time, there was still a lot of the very sort of empire influenced books um, around both in terms of history and in terms of fiction. So everything I think as a child in the sixties and seventies was telling you as a child of color that you didn't matter, that you weren't important, that your stories didn't matter and you absorb it, you have no histories. And what's interesting, I was recently researching um, the, the Georgians and I was listening to a podcast, the BBC History Extra podcast that was recorded about two or three years ago. And the presenter was talking to, to uh, somebody who'd written a book about Hans Sloan, who sort of started the original British Museum. So I knew that if you started the original British Museum, there were gonna be things that made me go, oh. but actually I didn't realize how much it would make me go. Oh. Um, because part of the podcast talked about him going to Jamaica. And there was a passing mention of, oh, there was enslaved people there. Like, yeah, you're going to say more, you're going to say, you're going to. And then, but he, but you know, then he, the enslaved people, you know, showed him around where the plants were. Yeah, but you're going to comment about enslaved people. And then the enslaved people played music for him and he liked the music conditions. Yes, but you're going to comment that they were enslaved and they didn't want to. And then there's this sort of bit was, oh, and he, 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 he sort of collected some of the sort of ephemera to do with, with, with slavery and, and he had a whip. And I was like, you're going to say something, slavery is bad. But the whip was made of manatee skin. And he was really fascinated. And I think, yeah, it probably had the skin of the last person it flogged on it as well. But there was no comment about, about the morality and the ethics and the horror of enslavement. It was about the manatee whip. And then there was a whole section about how he came back to England and how he invited a middle-class person instead of an upper-class person into a particular club. And that was a big deal. And again, it was one of those messages that tell us that our lives don't matter. So for us to get books into schools as, as, as soon as we can is so important. I mean, this is really just, I mean, not a history book, but one of the books, because I grew up in Sussex, so I didn't even grow up, grew up amongst Caribbean uh, sort of communities. And for me to try and fit in, I had to, in a sense, do an ethnic hop and hope and wish that I could be white. And I couldn't articulate some of my experiences because I didn't know how to. And then before those sort of days of the internet, you had got these little book clubs and you'd get a little brochure and you'll put a circle around your book and you go back home and you get your £3.29 from, from whoever and buy the book. And there'd been a series called Kizzy about a young woman from a gypsy community who went to mainstream school. And this was the original book, they did a quote, which I read as well. And it's actually a book that deals with racism. And it's the first time there'd been an articulation of my experience in a book. And again, for me, as, now, as a writer now, but not then, it gave me an insight to how you can find a safe space in books, how you can put stories in books that can change children's lives. So let me tell you about Diver's Daughter. Right, I can brandish it here. <laughs> so let me go back to my notes. What, the way Diver's Daughter happened is Tony Bradman, who's a white children's author, had um, been watching David Olasuga's um, series on BBC about black British history. And he just thought, oh my gosh, there's so much I don't know. He's quite influential. So he proposed to Scholastic Books that why don't they commission a series of uh, books inspired by UK? And again, as Candace was saying, it's so important, UK, Black and Asian history. And if you could tie it into the, the sort of primary school curriculum, you can actually get it into schools. So there was a, it had the time periods that he, that he wanted. And I was offered a choice between Romans and Tudors. Um, I chose sort of Tudors for, for two reasons. One, because my mum is a massive Tudor fan. I think it's because she was born a, born a Catholic, but didn't want to be. So she was very happy with Henry VIII sort of dissolving the monasteries. Um, and the second was I had actually, about a couple of weeks before, bought um, uh, Miranda Kaufman's Black, Black Tudors. I bought it in hardback, full price from my local independent store. So I thought, yeah, I could use that now. And I'd also heard Miranda talking about uh, Jack Francis on, um, on the radio as well, and the whole story about this diver from Africa who sort of uh, could sort of dive deeply without using equipment was absolutely enthralling. It kind of exploded the stereotypes about black people not being able to swim, 
But also, again, for me, who had never heard about people like me being around in England in um, you know, the sort of 16th century, it's like, oh my. Because there's two things that really impacted on me when I was younger. One was at primary school being asked to do um, a piece of creative writing, pretending we were Elizabethans, and me crying to my mum and saying, but we weren't here in Elizabethan times. And my mum goes going, yes, we were. I was like, ah. And the second thing was when I was in secondary school and um, out of 1700 kids, there's probably about one or two of us that were black. Um, the headmaster, uh, Mr. Trothowen, did a whole assembly about Jesse Owen. I hadn't heard of him, but actually hearing him talk about this, this black man who had made such a powerful gesture, and not just for me, but all the white kids sitting around me, again, was the first time I felt so proud of my heritage in such a public space. So you know these stories can change worlds. Um, I wanted to write a book about a child because... Um, the books were going into schools. And obviously Jack Francis, was as a, he was a teenager, I think when he came to, to sort of England, but he wasn't a child. So I wanted to make it child focused. I wanted to put a black child in Southwark in sort of uh, Elizabethan times. Um, I went down to Southampton to sort of uh, do some research. I went round to uh, the Museum of London. I went to the um, Mary Rose Museum. Um, I went into a big sort of nerd uh, vortex. Um, and it was an absolute, I'm not a historian and I'm not an academic. So I had to start really from scratch. It was absolute pleasure to, to write. So really finally, I just wanted to talk about impact very quickly. We got on breakfast TV. <laughs> We, we've, I've cut the Q&A, but in order oh, to demand for her time, okay. sorry because we've only got 10 more minutes. Oh my gosh, okay. <gasps> so, so <laughs> I'm just going to say then, this is just from a primary school. So this was, you know, we got, we got the book out to primary schools and teachers are sharing it. So one of the joys of being able to write this book is that it's actually getting out to children. So yeah, that was the final thing oh, I wanted to say. Sorry, I'm sorry to our audience because we've got no Q&A time because I want to hear, want to hear what Samantha says. And it's so interesting. I think everybody could just do a session on their own, actually. Next time, please, give them all a session. Right, Samantha Williams. Um, thank you very much for being our guest today. And after 15, this is your introduction, after 15 years of working in the media with no publishing experience, the frustration Samantha encountered regarding lack of diversity and cultural representation in TV and books motiv motivated her to create Book Club, the Travelling Multicultural Book Carnival, which is an online shop and travelling book carnival visiting schools, markets and festivals. There is massive underrepresentation, not, not just within the curriculum, but across all in media, especially within books. And Book Club is on a mission to change that with their new CIC and GoFundMe Book Club and Beyond. 20 people from every book sold goes towards putting free books into schools to make real change. Those who don't see themselves will find themselves at Book Club. Thank you very much, Samantha. I'm uh, sorry. Can you hear me all right? I've unmuted. Yes. Right, it's 10 to, so I'm just going to be like super quick. So maybe we can get five minutes of questions at the end. So my name is Samantha. I'm from Book Club, the Multicultural Travelling Book Carnival. Um, my career began in television, um, working and creating content for TV screens, and very quickly realised that um, my heritage and my Caribbean, African, Welsh background was never deemed relevant or interesting. And after 15 years of battling that, I gave up after having three children because I was too tired to keep fighting and also because my children needed their mum. And then I fell into book selling, which was just as challenging. But the reason I did that was because I did it for my children and I did it for um, the community. I felt the, the same challenges I faced in TV, being a creative. I was also facing now in education when my children entered nursery and, and primary school. The books they were bringing home were not a reflection of what we looked like as a family or my neighbors looked like or the world. And I decided to start selling books. They was, I was selling self-published books because I, they were more, the authors were more accessible. I could call them, I could reach them on the ground, I could meet them on street corners and I could pick up their books. 
and I could take them into schools. And I realized that the teachers and the people within education did value what I was doing. Um, and I wanted to like think about how I could have a bigger reach. And I decided to write to many publishers um, back then. So I thought, let me expand a little not just focus on self-publish, but I thought, what, what, what's this publishing world all about? I, did, I knew nothing about publishing um, or the publishing world at all. In fact, I don't think many people really understand. I often say to my customers, who published that book? They go, what do you mean? I'm like, look behind the book and it says at the back who published it. They're like, oh, right, okay. It's a it's very interesting dynamic. People don't understand publishing and I, I certainly didn't. Anyway, so I called up a publisher, literally called them on the phone. I said, I want to sell your book. I said, you need to speak to this person, to that person. And it ended up going round and round the houses. Anyway, cut a long story short, um, I wrote to all the main publishers, all the big ones, by just Googling them and finding their email addresses and said, look, this was in 2016. I said, can you send me all your catalogues? Because I want to find as many books that were children's books at the time that focus on black and brown families and, and narratives and stories. So I had all these massive like piles of um, catalogues, which I still have on my shelves from like four or five years ago. And I'd flick through them and obviously there was not much there. So it's, I realized, okay, we have a problem. Um, but I took what I could and I went through these catalogues. It's a very old fashioned way of doing it. I didn't go through these big wholesalers that exist because I wanted to really have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the publishers and, and speak to them and, and try and sort of beg them and implore them to, to think about including more black and brown stories and characters. So that was a long process. A lot of the publishers didn't really get back to me. A couple did. Um, maybe if I'd emailed them now, they would have all got back to me, but that's a separate story for a separate session. Um, yes, so I digress. So essentially the Book Love Carnival is um, an online shop and also a carnival, we travel the world, we travel to colleges, universities, schools, academic events, corporate events, we sell in for schools, festivals, parks, you name it. This weekend we're in Hackney um, Carnival, um, not Hackney Carnival, sorry, we're in Hackney um, Market and we're doing also South Norwood Market and we've got a, a load of dates coming up. Um, I'm looking at the watch because I haven't got much time. Um, and we've also got a website, which is thisisbooklove.com. We are campaigning for more multicultural books in schools across all levels. And I'm not just focusing on children. I think teachers are very important as well. Educators, librarians, we put book packs together. They're curated by me. I'm no expert. I go from my gut. I operate from a place of what I see and what I want to see more of. I haven't got the research. I haven't done the stats. I haven't, you know, I just go from a place of love because that's what, you know, it's book love. I'm very passionate about um, Africa and the Caribbean, the diaspora, Asia. I, I'm very passionate about representation. So I, I just operate from a, a gut feeling, really, a gut place of what works and what I want to see more of. Um, yeah, so that's the Book Love Carnival. And um, we're stocking all the books today that are being mentioned. And 20 pence from every book sold goes to our new charity, which is called Book Love and Beyond. And we are going to be raising money to put free multicultural books into schools for teachers, academics, university level and um, primary school, because there's not a lot of money that schools necessarily have according to the schools. So that's a bigger conversation about where they put their budgets, but um, we're giving books back because then there's no excuse. So we have a GoFundMe as well, where you, anyone could donate. We've raised 15,000 pounds so far. I do not know how. Customers buy a book, they drop five pounds into the GoFundMe. Customers might drop 10 pounds. We've had an anonymous donor. Someone put 500 pounds in. So we've, we've bought lots of books from the Jalak Prize and we're giving those away for free. Someone recently donated 4,000 pounds, a city, um, a corporate in the, a corporate company in the city donated 4,000 pounds. So we are collecting all of this money and we are going to be devising a really great way to get these books out. Um, and I think that's pretty much it for me. But just one, just one quick point I'd like to make about um, what Kandasi mentioned about when she went into Waterstones and didn't see the range of books. I think a couple of things, I think the, the, the books exist, but 
you know, they don't get the attention, they don't get the funding, they don't get the same marketing spend that some of the other books may get. And I think often book buying and the merchandisers and whoever are buying books in some of these shops aren't really thinking outside the box. And that's a whole big kind of thing that's happening in the background between publishers and the bookshops and the deals that they are making. And I think this is something we should be talking about more actually, because that's a massive wall and it's what you call that kind of gatekeeping. But I don't mind that they don't sell the books because that means everyone could come to a black owned business, a black owned bookshop and buy them like myself or New Beacon or you know all the other ones out there. So if they don't want to sell them, that's great. They can buy them from us and then we keep, keep the money in the economy and it's all circular. So thank you for listening. And um, yeah, try to do that in just under eight minutes. <laughs> so sorry. And I'm so sorry to Patrice because I really could have listened to more from you and I, I will ask you about research, but and hooray, there is time for questions, which is great, but before we have the questions and also thank you to Samantha and thank you for the work you're doing in getting all of our books out there. Before I come back to taking questions, I've got some questions. I hope anybody in the audience wants to ask via chat. I think Michael, you've got some, uh, you've got a film for us. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um... Sonia McGilchrist can't be with us today, but she's, she, she sent them this video and it's about a, a challenge, a proposition, an offer that she's doing. It's a call for submissions and I'm going to test the technology to the edge and I'm going to play a video. Okay. Hi, my name is Sonia McGilchrist. I am the owner and founder of Dinosaur Books Limited, which is a publisher of children's fiction. Um, you can find out more about us on the uh, website of what's happening in Black British history. And there you'll find out more about the company. You'll find out about our most recent title, which is called Children of the Benin Kingdom. Let me just show it to you quickly here. For children ages nine plus. And you can find out more about what we're thinking that we would like to publish in the future. So our submissions are open and they're always open. And we're particularly looking for um, people who want to write uh, fiction and historical fiction and historical fiction which features black stories, as does Children of the Benin Kingdom. We're not looking to repeat that, though. Um, we're looking for stories probably that look at black British history right now. If you have a look in the P at the PDF that I've uploaded, um, on the What's Happening in Black British History website, you'll see that I've um, uploaded a PDF that talks about a story called Black and White Duppy. Now that's actually a film that's getting made um, soon. It's a short film. Um, and the content of the film is the main protagonist is a teenager, a British Jamaican teenager. And the film explores racism and how he clashes with the older generations in his own family and how their experiences have been moulded by um, what they've um, what what they've come across since they arrived in this country in the fifties. So it's a kind of intergenerational story, um, exploring racism and how it kind of goes down through the generations in this one family, but affects each generation differently. I think it's really interesting. Um, and it's the sort of thing that I think that I would definitely like to explore in the future in book format. So if you're interested in writing something um, and you either have an idea or you're looking for ideas, do have a look at all the information about us um, in, the, in the appropriate part of what's happening in Black British History website. Um, and then please do get in touch. Our details are all there. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, I hope if there is any interest, I, you can you know where to contact. And I'd like to say thank you to all our speakers. And I'm really sorry that I hurried people up, um, especially Patrice. So I'm going to kick off the questions by asking her, because with a diver's daughter, 
you know, it's it's a it's rooted in a particular space as well in a particular time. And actually, that's something that I'm quite interested. We're now getting into history that isn't just necessarily London centric. Um, so what how did you go about that? Uh, I had to start from scratch, I think. And that's a very deliberate thing, because obviously everything I kind of knew about the Tudors, either through school or through watching um, endless sort of uh, dramas about Henry VIII being horrible to women. So, um, or occasionally Elizabeth I being a bit more horrible to men. (laughs) So I sort of started out, started from scratch. Um, I kind of knew the story that I wanted to tell, and because sort of Miranda, sort of Catherine had a detail so much about Jack Francis' life in in, uh, Black Tudors, that part was in a sense was done for me. And it's for me selecting what the bits that interested me. And also as, as, as Candace was saying, it's about, this is going into school. So what is a bit that I can write that will engage young people? But also what's the bits that I can smuggle in a bit underneath the adventure? So, cause one of the things that came up, I think in Black Jesus was the fact that he was um, the first man, uh, first man recorded of African descent. He's recorded in uh, giving evidence in a in an English court. And like, how do you sort of bring that into a children's book? I thought, I am going to bring that in there. So I think for me, I had different elements that I wanted to bring in there. I wanted again because history is obviously told by by wealthy people. All the pictures, you know, we see in the paintings are wealthy people. So there's a whole class element in there. So that kind of started off my, my research, you know, where would they live? Well, they'd probably live in Southwark. Um, so you sort of researched Southwark. I looked at lots of old maps. Spent a lot of time in a sort of Museum of London because I'm not very good at visualising things. So I needed to see, you know, what shoes would they wear? <laughs> what place would they wear? And then of course, you know, because it's historical, you ask yourself lots of questions. So like the um, etymology of words, would they have used the word breakfast? So you're looking it up, would they use lullaby? What did they eat in the mornings if they didn't call it breakfast? How on earth did they clean their saucepans if their sort of like potage got stuck onto the saucepan? So I looked all that up as well. It's interesting enough that I went to, I initially looked on the um, Mary Rose Museum website because I, uh, I was a teenager when they lifted the sort of Mary Rose from Portsmouth Harbour and it didn't impact on me at all. Um, I lived not far from there, but I think partly my little brother was born like the, um, in July, Mary Rose was lifted in August, 1982. My little brother was so horrible. It just kind of made me forget absolutely everything. But it also felt so disconnected to that, to that history that I didn't care. And when I first started researching, there was absolutely nothing on the Mary Rose uh, Museum website about uh, sort of uh, uh, Jacques Francis. And I think Miranda's book twisted that and made them think about it. So when you go in there, now there's a big thing about him, but also about ethnic diversity in all the sailors that wasn't there before. So again, it's how it sort of, it sort of changed lives. And I suppose lastly, I just did what I normally do is even when I write about London, as I just walk around the streets of, of Southampton, and I looked at the medieval walls, I touched them, I tried to envisage the boats there, I looked at old maps. I just so happy going down that nerdy vortex, you know, with loads and loads of notes and I thought, I need to write a story, but I absolutely love doing it. No, I'm sorry, it's great that you were talking about touching things. I think, I know this sounds ridiculous, but there is, it's a bit of magic, isn't it? Yes. And I think, for me, I was always, I remember going to a talk, a, a, a historical fiction writer, and she was talking about, oh, whenever, whenever I write a book, I always buy something for that period. And I was thinking, oh, you know, it, it's such an aspiration, I think. Sorry, I'm getting off topic here. But I just, I just, I just wanted to talk a quick last thing, I just thought, cause again, picking up something that sort of Candace was saying, there's something about when you're doing res- your, your search about how I almost regress when I'm looking through sort of mainstream history books and feeling that gratitude that is one tiny mention in a footnote of a person of colour, you know, because you're expunged from everything. And that's just that little thing that tells you they're there, but also about how much we're missing, you mm-hmm. know, how we're just not there. And I think just going through history books when you're researching, it just shows you. And I think the one mention I saw in a book in, from the 50s in Southampton Library about Jack Francis was something, it just referred to him, uh, a slave gave testimony. And I'm just thinking, that's it? This historical moment when this African man who may not even have been enslaved gave testimony. It's like a day, you know, slave gave testimony and that's, that's him written off. Mm-hmm. So it just felt, you know, again, about just how much the big void there is to fill, I suppose, with our, with our books. Sorry, Samantha, yeah? Are we allowed to put our hands up and ask questions? Yeah, 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 no, I think you can ask a question. I was gonna ask and please ask away. Yeah, I just wanted to put a thought out there. I was talking to someone the other day about 
writing books and writing books for children. And they said to me, I'm not interested in writing anything about history or black history if it's not on the curriculum. Now you can understand why this person is saying this because it gives their product commercial viability, right? You understand that, yeah? So if no, no. you write about Rosa Parks or but as Candace is here, I'll use Candace as an example, the Windrush, for instance, we know that Rosa Parks is on the curriculum and we also know that Benin is on the curriculum. So mm -hmm. anyone with any business savviness will want to write a book that they know they can sell to teachers. And I don't blame them for that. that, that that's a legitimate reason because we all have to eat. However, what you end up then doing is having a very narrow sort of um, collection of books that are being published. Because obviously the publishers are thinking the same. How do we move away from this? Because I want to write, I might want to write a book about, I don't know, um, some, I, I mean, okay, Queen of Freedom about Nanny of the Maroons. Nanny of the Maroons isn't necessarily on the curriculum per se, but you, I know that you can use different references to elucidate points on the curriculum. You understand where I'm going with this, right? Yeah. No, sorry, Karen, I'll bring Karen in. I'm dying to speak, but yeah, Karen. <laughs> This is a historical problem, Sam. It is something that has gone on for years and years. And so really what needs to change is the publishing industry because the publishing industry is the one that not only allows writers to write about things uh, for, uh, and I'm sure that you know we'll hear more about this in educational publishing as well, but also um, they are the ones who market the books and, um, if they're not marketed, it doesn't matter how great your book is about anything, even something that's on the curriculum, they're just gonna disappear. And black British texts tend to disappear much faster than white authored texts about black British su subjects. Absolutely. And I mean, this is where I have spent my whole life going wrong because I love the 18th century, which is never on the curriculum and is probably, I would argue, one of the pivotal centuries in what it is to be. I mean, actually, there's something in all centuries. But Georgian history is so important to Black Britain, to Britishness, actually, the whole. In, and it's not it's just not covered for young people. But that's actually one of the questions I was gonna ask everyone is why are we tied to the classroom? This is not, this is about, I would argue that we're not talking about educational publishing here. We're talking about what is reading for pleasure and why should, you know, we, we can say, oh, you've got to learn this thing. No, what we, people like Candace and Patrice and me, it's about, enjoyment surely isn't it why does black british history have to be tied to the curriculum it's not just about what black children reading it's about reading so why do children do you think children should read history outside of the classroom discuss yes Kabasi. So I have to say I completely disagree with what that person said to Sam and that hasn't actually been my experience. I haven't written any books because they're on the curriculum. The Story of the Wind Rush is written for children age eight plus. I don't think they're supposed to be doing migration or wind rush at that age. They might do it at key stage three. So I completely didn't pay any attention to that. I just wrote, like I said, where I could see the gaps and people have responded to it. Teachers are clever enough if they can get a text. And I agree with what Karen said, that there is the aspect of how the book is going to be marketed and promoted. So I sold the Story of the Windrush from my second bedroom. My second, I've lived as if I'm in a one bedroom for 10 years because my second bedroom is just full of thousands or was full of thousands of books. And I'm on the second floor as well with no lift. And I've did that, but like I said, I had support from people like, you know, Book Love and New Beacon, and there were black book retailers. And once teachers and people started to get the book, they could see what to do with it. Last week, I did a virtual school visit with a school in Yorkshire, and most of the children in the class, it was two classes, were white. It was year five. And the questions that they asked 
was so inspiring and motivational for me. It's just really encouraging me to get on with my next book. And it, it was just wonderful. They asked so many questions. The teacher had they'd read the book, they'd got their questions ready. I did my chat with them and I was just like challenged by the questions. They are interested, whether it's on the curriculum or not. Intelligent teachers, and most of them are, can craft their lessons. They can do non-fiction Fridays. I've seen people putting things online, teachers saying they use the book for this thing, that thing. I don't know about these things. I didn't write it thinking about these themes or anything, but I just did it. And then if you can do it and get a little bit of support and get it out there, people will know what to do with it. And maybe that's how we can then make the change. And, and uh, that's what I think anyway. Candace, can I ask you what your next book is, please? I don't know if I'm allowed to say yet. Oh, okay. I am writing it. It's a bit of a mess. But I am writing. I think I can say soon. Okay. <laughs> but I don't know if I'm allowed to say yet. But it's supposed to be coming out in October. Notice the word supposed to be. So I think also that we have to address uh, the teachers who maybe don't necessarily um, think about Black British history. And that's, uh, you know, Darren and I agree that that was one of the reasons that we wanted to do um, the column because so many teachers were asking. Um, they didn't know that there was any British history uh, for Black people out there. And so we wanted to make sure that some of those books got highlighted along the way. Mm. Yeah. Patrice, yes. You had yeah. your... I was just going to really endorse exactly what sort of Contessa was saying because you know, I get approached by teachers online who are reading Diver's Daughter in their classes and they use it for many different things. So it gets, sort of gets used for history, but it gets, quite, it use, gets used quite a lot for creative writing. And about, um, you know, about empathy, about putting, uh, you know, about descriptions, I get sent excerpts of, of writing. But in terms of historic, I don't understand that. I grew up sitting there on Sundays watching BBC One where there's a historical drama and then it gets novelised and you buy the novel. As a kid, I, I bought, you know, I can't remember what it's called, it's not Wrinkling Time, but one where this girl goes back into Tudor times and, uh, you know, I read loads of those books for pleasure, not to learn. So actually... If you are business, and also it depends on honestly about why you write. If you're writing with a business sense to insert yourself, to build a career as a business writer, then you go for where the gaps are. But I, I do need to eat, you know. <laughs> I sort of, you know, everything, oh, you know, oh, I have to support myself to be writing, but I love creativity. I love getting stories out. But I, for me, my passion is representation. It's about how we explore representation history in modern stories in picture books. And I think that's what will drive me in lots of different ways. Uh -huh. No, I, I absolutely agree. It's about saying we were here and we wore the frocks for me. <laughs> that, that's, that's how I got into it because I haven't even got an O level. It was all about, it was watching those things on the telly and then going to the books and then finding things out that make you just go, wow, and wanting everybody else to, to know those things and, and to realise that it is part of everyone's history and how we got to here, not, not just as black British people, how Britain got to here is so dependent on this multiplicity of things that we are all a part of. That sounds extremely, but yes, have we got any questions for outside of I missed? Oh, I haven't got any. Darren, Darren's got his hand up. Okay, Darren, sorry, I couldn't see you. I was looking, Darren. <gasps> just to say, I mean, coming in on this, that I, I think <clears throat> that there is a sort of groundswell that it's been, whereas a lot of curriculum changes, particularly in England, are top down. There are announcements that are made and, and everyone, the whole system has to sort of conform and jump to those demands. What's happened is that from parents and activists, there's been this demand for books from people like Kandase sort of doing things, you know, sacrificing a bedroom to get things done. And then going back to people like Verna Wilkins doing, doing things. And she always talks about how she started the whole thing at her kitchen table. But what I see now are green shoots where teachers are saying, you know, they, they want to be, they, they want to find black British history books. Uh, you know, when I started teaching 20 years ago, it was Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, it could be, because if you go on to, you know, 
well-known book selling websites and put in black history it's american books that come up again and again mm -hmm. but, but there's there's now not only from sort of activists and, and the community but from teachers there's a real demand for those books and that will i think filter upwards where i'm seeing green shoots is the exam boards i've been you know many of us have been asked to sort of consult on exam boards attempting to diversify and when exam boards do that, even if it's only one or two books, that has a knock on effect further down the curriculum. Teachers suddenly realize they might need to teach black authors. Uh, and, and are they equipped for that? Because teacher training never, certainly in my experience, never touches that. The other place where there are green shoots is in Wales. Mm -hmm. The Welsh uh, review of the curriculum led by Professor Charlotte Williams, uh, there is a, a conscious effort to uh, acknowledge the history of people of color in Wales. And what that's going to do, I think, is then create a demand, Wales is a small country, I know, but a demand for stories and for resources. And I think when you see like David Olashoga's book, there, there's, there's more and more of this books written for adults will then get a, a remix for children. And anyone who's writing, I know, Mar I think Miranda's doing that as well. Anyone who's writing these books for adults, I think, you know, either you or commission someone do a version for key stage two because mm -hmm. teachers will lap it up that's mm -hmm. my view anyway uh-huh uh-huh sorry any anyone else before i mean one thing that irritates me as a writer is you know yes there's this the, the hangover that we the black history is american history but what we find is that it doesn't go the other way so Actually, and the thing about publishing in the UK is it's a small market and we have to eat, people like me and Kandasi and Patrice, we have to eat. And very often American publishers, American, they're not interested in black British history. It's parochial, it's not important to them. And I've got two hands up, Kandasi and then Samantha, yeah. Well, I want to ask you, Catherine, about what you just said. Do you really think that the Americans aren't interested in the black British history though? Yes. I, because I've just, I found that when they hear about the Windrush, few people, I mean, I maybe haven't done enough, and I don't know enough, but they do actually seem interested. So could it be that over there, they're maybe not also being given that opportunity? Or do you think they definitely don't want to know? I think it's publishers, uh, you know, the, it's the gatekeepers, it's publishers. Assume okay. It's yeah, I mean, most people in America don't know Black British history. And for years when I taught undergraduates there, they didn't even know there were Black people in Britain uh, because of the tutors and, you know, the, those kind of uh, costume dramas, which were all white people. I, I do think they would be interested if they had the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Samantha, yes. Yeah, um, I just wanted to expand a little bit on this. So I get a lot of... Um, parents and carers and grown-ups who come to us complaining that they can never find any black history books in their school reading corners or in their school libraries or coming home with them so I, I believe that you know this isn't like an anecdotal comment like this is a real problem like parents are crying out for this content so even though the teachers um, may know there's a problem I think what someone on the panel said you know whether or not they're interested is another thing and it's just down to lack of resources and lack of support that teachers get they've already got enough on their plate they're pretty much following an Ofsted model and that's the quickest easiest model to follow that's going to get them the outstanding that they want at the end of the year or every two years thinking outside of that box is another chore almost another thing that they have to do so it feels quite burdensome for a lot of teachers so they come to us and they're like you know begging us for you know eventually they come and they're sort of asking for the content but it often feels like a bit of a chore and a bit of like oh, I've got to do this and a second point was about the publishers um again we have customers who are coming to us and saying we want to get we want to read about more black British icons but they're always American so when I feed this back to the publishers because I because I've got you know I can call them and say look why aren't you doing this they'll say well it's not going to sell it needs to have a global appeal so so a book i'll use an example not related to the statement i just made like young gifted and black like that was huge that book and it did have in people like zadie smith it had in a few british ones as well but the majority will always be american because the british publishers don't think that people overseas are interested in 
um, I don't know, Claudia Jones. I think she's actually in the book, to be fair. So I, you know, there are there, there so for instance, like what Candassi was saying, we've done some Zooms together to a global audience, myself and Candassi, speaking about the Windrush. And they, they are lapping it up. So I think the publishers have got it all wrong. I think it's their own bias and their own black, well, their own prejudice, let's say. I, I say it like it is. I haven't done any research. I don't have the stats to back it up. Like I said, I speak from the gut and I speak from what I see. I think the publishers have their own bias. We live in a capitalist world. They're going for the easy thing that they believe is sellable and they're missing out and it's having a really detrimental effect. And I very get very angry about it because I know what my customers want and I can't give it to them, which is why I go to the self-published authors and I sell books like The Secrets of the Afro Comb, which is one of Candace's first books. What a fantastic title. So first of all, you've got children saying, Miss, what's an Afro comb? You take the Afro comb, you take the book and you've opened up this whole world. What A publisher would not do that. So in a way, I think, you know, stop the publishers. Let's put money into self-publish. Black, authentic, uncensored voices that can make this content. That's how I feel. Or more black publishers and brown publishers who get it. I, I, can't, I can't disagree with you. I really can't. I think... I, I mean, I I think we all know there are difficulties because there's difficulties in uh, sustaining, you know, in, in money, in the making. And, and this is a very boring yeah. topic for people who are not writers. But, you know, how do we get continued writing that also that will inspire readers to read more, which is ultimately the, the foundation for everything? Um, so... And, and history, it's another layer because it's so often viewed as something that is a chore. And actually the one thing that Patrice said, which is the same for me, is that for a lot of us, we got interested first of all through telly because you know, you, know, you wanted you either wanted to wear the dresses or it was exciting or it was accessible. And very often historical fiction is seen as literary and therefore exclusive. I mean, I do think that is changing. But it's not, it's not a genre, you know, it's not like fantasy. It doesn't have the readership that fantasy is. And, you know, we're talking about two, we're talking about nonfiction and we're talking about fiction here. And I think fiction will always be, you know, nonfiction will be seen, there'll be place for it in the classroom, whereas fiction, it's a harder sell sometimes. I mean, how do you find that, Samantha, as a bookseller? Is it that parents are wanting nonfiction rather than fiction? Or is it both? Um, are parents wanting fiction, what, for their children or for themselves? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for, for, for their children. Fiction or non-fiction. Um, I mean, how does historical fiction, is there a space for that, for reading for pleasure, do you think? Well, I've just taken on the Own Voices series, um, mm -hmm. which I will be pushing. I think, I'm just really thinking about that question. When customers approach the carnival, they they often don't know what they want, you know? Yes. It's really interesting because how do you know what you want for dinner if you don't know what's in the fridge? Do you know what I mean? It's like, so they need to see it because remember their parents have come, most of them have come through a, 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 a British colonial curriculum. So they don't even know about the divers that, you know, the diver's daughter, the diver, the Mary Rose di um, divers, you know, they'll know slavery. Mm -hmm. and then you'll get your custom, my customers who are like diehard Pan-Africanists who will want the ancient African history and they'll want that for their children. But that's coming from a very different place. It's coming from a very political place. So this reading for pleasure bit in the middle, I think is, is hugely neglected. And I really think that our custom, that the publishers don't value our, my customers. I don't think they value them. I don't think they think that they read books some of the time. I mean, I know this sounds a little bit harsh and a little bit extreme, but this is a rhetoric that's been going around for a long time that, you know, black parents, they don't teach their kids. They don't read to their children. This sounds radical and uncomfortable listening, but I think sometimes we have to really dig a little Deep to touch on some of these subjects to really look at what the core challenges are and, the, and what we have to face. 
it sounds horrible to say, but you know, I know what I see on the ground. I know what I hear. You know, I'm talking to publishers all the time and God bless them. You know, they're so far removed from my, from my customers. You know? and, um, yeah. When the books do come out as, Karen was saying earlier, they often have a very short sales life yeah. and, you know, don't reach the audience. I am keen if there's any of the attendees who would like to ask questions, um, please let us know. Um, I don't think I've got anything about, I mean, there are, you know, there are, organ there are attempts to um, uplift uh, what's being written about, but I think history is a special case here because so often it is seen as, you know, as Kandasi was saying, the, the results giving, sharing these books with white audience, saying that this is are all our histories is actually one of the most fundamental things about it rather than just saying, this is black British history and it's only for black Britons. I think to get that, fact out I'm looking I'm looking again to see if if we've got any questions rather than it's just me I, mean, I, I just I just want to say I'm not like bashing the publishers all the time I don't want to appear that way because there are publishers now who are putting out some fantastic books what um, would you recommend then Samantha as a as a bookseller well I'm really excited about um Judy Hepburn's book about Ira Aldridge I mean, how many of you know about Ira Aldridge? I'm sure some of the panelists do, but you know, how many people in the audience knew that Ira Aldridge was an African-American who lived in London? He lived not far from where I live now in South Norwood. There's a blue plaque outside his house. He was a Shakespearean actor. So mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a lovely little cute children's book that's out about him. It's just published by um, Scholastic. And obviously you've got the Own Voices series. Um, you know, those those books, once you put them out there and people, they're such an easy sell because you're saying, did you know about this? And they'll no, tell me, wow. And the children's eyes light up. And that's what you want to engage children with history that they've never heard before, because that will empower them and set them on a journey that exists outside of the narrative around slavery. I don't want any more books about slavery. I'm not saying that slavery is not important. Of course, it's of course it's more than important. That word doesn't just, you know, it, it, it needs to be taught, but you can't have a generation of young people coming out of the education system thinking my history started with slavery. That is abuse, it's abusive. And we have to move away from that. And teachers start with that because again, it's on the curriculum. And you know, I want to read about the diver's daughter. I want to read about um, that 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 series. You know, I want to read about uh, Ira Aldridge and all the other amazing, like Samuel Coleridge Taylor, and you know, all the others. That there's so oh, much material. Do you want to stumble in? Um, I've got a question from Jo Dedrea, who is a, a school librarian, and she's asking, how do you see school librarians in this battle to being bring unpromoted books to children? And actually, I think they're some of the strongest uh, when allies that we can have as writers and publishers. But anybody like to talk, Patrice? I think absolutely. And I think, you know, part of being a writer for children, and young people anyway, is how you get in cahoots with the librarians and the various librarians organisations. Um, for me, you know, I, I just, you know, I am so grateful for, to librarians who have put my books in the hands of, of young people. So I suppose what we're looking at is ways that publishers and independent booksellers um, and uh, writers can have more opportunities to come together with librarians. Scholastic have done some work with Voices, so we, we did a sort of panel for sort of a, a librarian's panel. And again, I think it's, you know, what, what you're saying before, people are absolutely engaged. They want those stories. People want to educate. There's all big cause librarians, uh, you know, they're a bit like me. They're quite often quite nerdy. They want that knowledge themselves. It's like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that. I want to know that. And once you've got that knowledge, you want to sort of uh, pass it on. And I think it's supposed going back to, to Voices when we sort of think about how it can be done well or how I think it was done well. It feels that, you know, Scholastic, obviously, a sort of, you know, well-known sort of publisher, but I think it didn't feel that it was a, um, uh, a sort of a tokenistic project. 
it felt that there was a lot of thought behind it. You know, the fact that, you know, they bid and bid again for me and Bally to go on, on BBC TV to talk about it. Um, you know, the way to get our writers and voices on the different panels engaging. Um, and I felt there's a lot of heart behind it and a lot of care, but also the slightly sneaky thing with actually allying it with bits of the curriculum so it does go into schools. And I think it also does build on what you're saying. I've met loads of white teachers who are furious about the, the current curriculum. They really want to teach the other stuff. They really want to educate about themselves. They really want children, whether they're black or white or whatever background, to know that the history in the UK is a mix of so many different things. It's not just the heading queens and the monument to the, the fire of London. So I think, you know, librarians can get that to, 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 to children, but I think there is that wider thing about how we, the different sneaky ways <laughs> that we can engage with schools, teachers, and I suppose ultimately with, with parents and, and carers. I, I'm all for sneaky ways. Um, I think, um, oh, and thank you, Kandasi's put on some uh, notes. There's a lot of interesting stuff in the chat. Um, I'm, it's been lovely speaking with everyone and sharing your knowledge. The Books for Keeps Beyond the Secret Gardens columns are fantastic. If you hadn't re haven't read them, you are in for a treat. Uh, Patrice's books, Candace's books, uh, and um, Samantha knows what she's selling. So there we go. So thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for listening for attendees. And we've had quite a few. So I hope it's been interesting.